to all. Um, let me first begin by thanking Dr. Vikram Patel for accepting this request to speak without a moment's hesitation. His credentials are too well known to require repetition. One exceptional credential, of course, which I discovered only last night, is that he happens to be the son-in-law of Mr. Anil Devan, a doyen of our bar. What we face is unprecedented. The COVID does not adjust to man-made conceptions. The suicide of three lawyers was a grave warning signal. There is complete uncertainty of how long it will remain. It therefore became imperative to determine how to respond. Our profession is inherently competitive. The structures in the legal system generate anxiety. Even in normal times, there could be issues of financial insecurity, inequality of opportunity, nepotism, etc., as they are perceived individually by lawyers. The COVID not only attacks our bodies, but also our minds. The insecurities generated by the legal system are enhanced as we suffer isolation, lockdowns, and unlockdown. So therefore, the aim of this talk is to realize and internalize that while circumstances may be beyond our, our control, our response is our choice. How should we respond is where we seek answers from Dr. Patel. I was lucky to attend two excellent webinars on mental health organized earlier, one by Mr. Satvik Verma, advocate, and the other by the president of the Supreme Court Bar Association, Mr. Dushan Dave. The takeaway was that we need to reach out to each other, and it is by the very act of helping another deal with his anxieties and fears that we will improve our own mental health. I therefore see in this crisis of physical distancing a great opportunity to come closer to each other mentally and forgetting all our distinctions and competitions, build a bond to assert our humanity against a terrible force. So Dr. Patel will speak for about half an hour to 20 or 40 minutes. Due to paucity of time, since there were a large number of questions received, we have already shared many of the questions with Dr. Patel, who has structured his talk accordingly. Ranveer, who will take on the role of further coordination, will be asking additional questions as well as taking questions on the chat to make this session a balance of interactive and already sent questions. And the vote of thanks will be given by Pallav Mongya Advocate, whose post for the first time set me thinking that we must do something about it. Uh, over to you, Dr. Patel, now uh, for the talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prashantu. And I want to just say, first of all, thank you very much for this opportunity. As you rightly pointed out, uh, I have lived most of my adult life as a member of a legal family. Uh, and I have uh, a come very close to understanding each of my, my family members as, as lawyers, but I've never really been uh, had the opportunity to engage with the broader legal community. And, um, and so this is a wonderful opportunity for me. I also want to thank you for your foresight in actually um, assembling a webinar on a subject that I don't believe the legal community really has ever addressed. Um, that is its own well-being, the well-being of its own members. Uh, Prashanto, I also want to acknowledge, um, you know, uh, uh, with gratitude, your uh, the preamble that you sent to me, because as I said earlier, I, although I know lawyers as, as relatives, um, uh, both my brothers-in-law are also lawyers, um, uh, but I think I don't really know how the legal profession is organized, maybe in the same way that maybe none of you know how the medical profession is organized. Um, but it is true that in all professional groups, there are a variety of professional uh, hierarchies and anxieties that are created. And I could see from your preamble that the legal profession is no different. Um, uh, and I can, I can speak on behalf of the medical profession. I see so many similarities in what you sent me. Uh, you know, the competition for survival uh, is, is a central one here, particularly uh, given that a large proportion of doctors work in the private sector, and I would assume almost all lawyers work in the private sector. There's an inherent competition, but unlike the competition that happens in the free market between companies, this is typically competition between individuals. Uh, and that is particularly difficult because you then have to balance off uh, how do you compete with somebody uh, day to day and yet retain uh, the possibility of creating uh, solidarity and a friendship uh, with people who you're inherently competing with. It also strikes me that the legal profession is unique amongst uh, uh, all the professions that I can think of in which sometimes friends can be on opposite sides uh, in, in a particular case uh, and may often have to say things 
um, and appear to say things that might actually be quite, um, uh, might, might come across to the other person as being quite insensitive and even hurtful. So that's something very particular, again, about the legal profession. And of course, all of this is pre-COVID. So um, uh, this, is, this is the sort of uh, a hyper-stressed environment uh, that the legal profession already brings uh, with it. I was also thinking about some of the other things you wrote, Prashanto, about the very notion of losing and winning. Uh, which again is very peculiar. It's probably, you know, I can see an analogy with the sporting profession. Uh, actually, that might be a good example here, you know, where people race against each other and yet at the end of the race might still go and have uh, a meal together as friends, uh, but only one person will win and the other will lose. And there is a certain degree of a hierarchy uh, that creeps in there and also a certain degree of defeat and victory. Um, there's, of course, the uncertainty that comes with working alone and in this highly unregulated sector the ad hocism uh, that uh, that you describe in the hiring and firing, uh, and of course the financial anxiety that comes with it. Another thing that you reminded me about, of course, is the feudal system that pervades every profession, and that to some extent is not uh, unique to India, but actually it is very, very strong in India. Uh, I, again, speaking as a physician, I know that uh, uh, you know families are very powerful uh, uh, feudal uh, aspects of the medical profession, some of the leading professional uh, doctors, for example, come from families of doctors, and it's very clear that that is also true uh, in the bar. Uh, and of course, these days, we also have seen how the feudal system pervades a variety of other sectors in our society, such as Bollywood. Um, but what is particularly important within this feudal system isn't the fact that some individuals, some people might profit uh, from it, but that there are others who, for no fault of their own, other than they don't, that the fact that they don't belong, uh, are often marginalized. Uh, and so here, for example, one thinks about uh, people from minority communities, women who have historically always been marginalized in all the mainstream professions in India, people with disabilities, uh, people with different sexual identities, people from Dalit communities, and so on. And finally, of course, although many of us from outside the legal profession are accustomed to see lawyers, I guess, as the way you are accustomed to see doctors as being very wealthy, uh, and powerful. Of course, we know that this only represents the tip of the iceberg. And, um, and in fact, the base of the iceberg represents a, a large pool of struggling professionals uh, in all sectors who are really clawing to try to get to the top and knowing very well that only a small proportion uh, of those who start that particular climb uh, will get to the top. So I wanted to acknowledge that you know, the profession itself brings with it many different stressors that were occurring before COVID-19. But of course, as Prashanto has reminded us, uh, COVID-19, the pandemic itself, has propelled mental health to the center of public debate and discourse. In fact, it would be fair to say that if you, if you, you know, discount virus-specific conversations, for example, how many people have died and how many cases there are, testing, vaccines, and so on, and you consider what is the next most common issue in relation to health, that society is currently grappling with, that the media is, uh, is profiling, it's of course mental health. Um, to me, that's a, that's a very big uh, uh, surprise, but also of course it's very welcome. Um, for the first time, it seems to me, uh, uh, mental health has been very widely talked about uh, in a variety of sectors, including for example, in this very webinar, uh, by communities uh, and sectors that have rarely ever even acknowledged this subject as a legitimate subject uh, for public conversation. Now, part of this, of course, has to do with the, the very extreme uh, uh, tragic acts, such as the suicide that Prashanto mentioned of three, uh, uh, of, three uh, uh, of your community. But of course, uh, suicides are very common. Um, uh, uh, indeed, more recently, many of you will have uh, uh, been uh, aware of the suicide of the celebrated actor Sushant Singh Rajput. Uh, this happened just a few days after the suicide of his manager. Um, and this, in turn, has precipitated, of course, a very uh, a strong public uh, uh, acknowledgement about the importance of mental health and how it's often hidden uh, from public view. In fact, soon after the suicide, uh, uh, Milind Deora, one of our uh, prominent younger politicians, uh, gave a long interview about his own tryst with clinical depression. So the imperative really right now is that to seize this moment uh, and to have a much more open conversation to understand the nature of mental health and mental health distress uh, and what we must do about it in these troubled times. And that's what really I want to turn to now. 
first of all, um, I would like to just give a broader introduction about what we mean by mental health, because I just, uh, I think many of us might have somewhat differing ideas, and I wanted to clarify what is the science of mental health, uh, what defines our mental health, uh, and, and then move on to the second part of my talk, which is to consider what has been the impact of this pandemic on our mental health, and then finally, uh, what might be the things that we as a professional group, in your case, uh, you know, the group of lawyers or the bar association, uh, as well as what can we as individuals uh, do to actually protect ourselves uh, from the stresses that are, are, are so uh, obvious um, and to actually promote uh, mental health and prevent mental health problems. So let me start by first of all clarifying that when I am speaking about mental health, I am going well beyond mental illness. In the same way that when one talks about physical health, when one's not talking about diseases, one's talking about feeling physically well, uh, it's exactly the same for mental health. And I'd like to propose to you that mental health is actually our single greatest personal asset. It defines who we are as human beings. Let's acknowledge that what makes us who we are as human beings is not the color of our skin. It is not the bones that we have in our body. It isn't the hair that we have on our head, but it is actually the trimurti of the emotions that we experience day to day, the thoughts that course through our mind, and the way we interact with each other, our behavior. It is this trimurti that really defines our daily experiences of our lives, and it is this what I call our mental health. And remember, our mental health is something that is with us constantly, even when we're asleep. Mental health is very central then to our very capability. Let us consider for a moment what you are doing right now. You're listening to me. You're trying to stay awake. You hope that I won't uh, drone you into sleep. You're trying to concentrate and follow the points that I'm communicating to you. While you listen, you're experiencing reactions, various reactions or thoughts that are going through your mind as well as feelings that you're experiencing in your body. You're itching to ask a question and you might uh, use the chat box to do so. All of this, my friends, are features of your mental health. And if your mental health was impaired in any particular way, all of these or some of these would in fact become a huge struggle. For example, concentrating and following what I'm saying. Now, the other uh, you know, thing I want to uh, emphasize is that we often think of mental health as separate from physical health, and I have to blame the foundations of medicine uh, for this. Uh, uh, the French uh, philosopher René Descartes is actually uh, often blamed for, for this separation of mental and physical health. You know, if you look at our ancient systems of medicine like Ayurveda, there is no separate mental health. In fact, mental health and physical health are really seen as two sides of the same coin. They're inseparable. And you also see this, for example, uh, in traditional Chinese medicine, for example, in acupuncture. It is modern biomedicine that separated the mind from the body. Uh, and unfortunately, this is the worst uh, separation that has ever happened, the worst, schis worst schism, because actually what science teaches us is that these two are completely inseparable. And I want to give an example of a physical health condition, which I'm sure many lawyers uh, would be very concerned about, and with, which is heart disease. We now know, without any doubt whatsoever, that high levels of stress, and I'll turn to what I mean by that later on, are, is amongst the most important risk factors on par with smoking for the development of heart disease and the precipitation of a heart attack. But we also know that when you have a heart attack and you develop depression after the heart attack, your risk of dying in the subsequent 12 months is two to threefold higher. So here you can really quite clearly see how stress affects human biology in a way that increases your risk of precipitating a heart attack, but also after you've already had a heart attack, the existence of mental health problems actually worsens the outcome of the heart disease. You cannot treat heart disease without also attending to mental health. I want to end by uh, this part of my talk by really recognizing that mental health is a very complex aspect of ourselves. Uh, unlike heart disease, for example, which you can probably reduce to three or four risk factors, actually what determines our mental health is a very complex interplay of our genetic inheritance, what we've inherited from our parents, and what they've inherited from their parents, in fact, our developmental story, which simply means the experiences that we had, particularly in the first two decades of our life, when a brain is most plastic, 
it's most malleable, it responds exquisitely to environmental factors. And you know, this is one of the key reasons why child neglect um, in various forms is one of the most important uh, risk factors for poor mental health in later life. Our environment, both now as well as in the past, uh, and of course I'll turn to why the environment right now is so particularly toxic. All of these combine across our life course to determine who we are as individuals. And you can quickly see that this is the reason why each of our stories of our mental health is very intimate. It's very unique to our own life stories. This is why even identical twins all often have very different mental health experiences. Even though they share exactly the same genes, they in fact have always very different life stories. And this is why even identical twins uh, often turn out to have very different personalities and very different mental health stories. I want to now turn to the question, the second part of my talk, which is um, what's the impact of this pandemic on our mental health? Now, I like to think of this in two different acts, um, as if like we're watching a movie. Um, I wish this was a movie. Unfortunately, it's all very true. But imagine that this is a movie. There is an act before the interval, and that's the act that we're in right now. It's an act that began earlier this year and really accelerated uh, in March um, when, um, well, in, at the end of January, the WHO announced uh, the pandemic. And in March, uh, 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 the prime minister in India announced the national lockdown. And for me, this current act is a pandemic, but of a different kind, a pandemic of fear. This pandemic of fear that is sweeping across the nation has many terrible consequences, uh, not least, of course, which has been uh, the way we have stigmatized one another. Um, but we can turn to that later on. But what, what, what disturbs me the most is the, the way we've stigmatized people who have been infected uh, by the virus as well as their families. Um, but let's turn for now to thinking about what is the cause of this pandemic of fear. And Prashantal, you really uh, hit the right word on the head, and that is the question of uncertainty. Uncertainty, that is to say, not being able to be sure of what tomorrow will bring, is one of the most serious threats to our well-being and our mental health. And I'll tell you why that, that is in a moment. But before I turn to that, let us just consider the sheer breadth of uncertainties we are facing today. Look, we all face uncertainties in our life, right? I mean, all of us, uh, none of us can be 100% sure, for example, what uh, you know, next year would look like. But at least we have some degree of certainty to guide us. Right now, we have the most incredible range of uncertainties. For example, the uncertainty about our own risk to contract the virus, the uncertainty about the well-being of our family and friends, particularly our elderly relatives. The uncertainty why so many countries in the world have faced such an unprecedented epidemic. The uncertainty about why India, which saw the most stringent lockdown in the world more than four months ago, is seeing the epidemic now spiraling out of control. The uncertainty about whose advice we should listen to, because you know there's so much, there's so many experts, in, both on television and on, in our media. Uh, oftentimes, these experts disagree with each other. Uh, there are conspiracy stories, and this can be all quite overwhelming because you can no longer even be sure about who knows exactly what is going on. You can't even trust scientists anymore. And I wrote about this actually um, in the Indian Express yesterday about this. So this is very unsettling uh, uh, for people outside the scientific community who aren't accustomed to, to recognizing that actually scientists also disagree and argue with each other uh, because we don't really always know the answers to all the questions that are posed before us. The uncertainty about when life will return to anything resembling even what it used to be even as recently as just six months ago. And of course, the biggest uncertainty of all, which is what will our future livelihoods look like. Now, there's no uh, real uh, uh, you know, way to be actually certain about that, but, but Prashanta reminded me that the legal profession historically has always presented a number of uncertainties about economic prospects, particularly uh, for the younger generation of lawyers. Uh, he reminded me, uh, and in fact, my father-in-law used to often tell me as well, um, is that, you know, in the old days, um, you know, lawyers uh, typically spend many years working as a junior in a, in a more established practice, often uh, with very little pay or a very paltry salary. 
But the younger generation of lawyers, of course, have uh, aspirations uh, to be successful much quicker. They've gone through, uh, you know, major law schools, incurred quite large uh, bills due to their education, just like younger doctors have. Um, and also, they are not that prepared uh, uh, to, to, to sort of stride through this kind of much more hierarchical, uh, feudal way of growing in the practice as the previous generation did. And of course, they're in a much greater hurry. And what a terrible time it is for them, because right now, the entire system of practicing law, as indeed many other uh, uh, professions, uh, has really been thrown under the bus. There is literally no work for many lawyers. And even for those with work, there's no structure to that work. I can tell you honestly, as a professor at Harvard Medical School, what I miss most uh, is the fact that I can be physically with my team uh, in Boston, uh, at least for uh, the time that I'm there, which is usually half the year. I am no longer able to socialize with them. I'm no longer able to brainstorm uh, research meetings with them. Um, I'm no longer able to just hang out and have a cup of coffee with them and create the informality that makes our working relationships so much more pleasurable. Zooming, let's be absolutely honest, we're all fed up of it. Many, at least I am increasingly getting fed up of it. Um, you know, it's, it works up to a point, uh, but the lack of social contact all begin to wear our minds down. There's also the other, uh, other challenge of working from home on Zoom, uh, especially for women lawyers. Um, and that is, of course, that they have to suddenly also manage their domestic chores. And especially with schools closed, those who have young children at home who would historically have just basically sent their kids to school are suddenly also having to manage uh, the remote educational needs of their kids. There is increasing uh, a description in the media about you know, some of the increased stresses of being back into the house together, something, you know, let's be honest, all of us, are uh, we, we develop certain routines, right? And we can start to acquire a certain meaning because of the week. Um, and during the week, we leave in the morning, we come back in the evening, we occupy different spaces uh, in the evening and the daytime. This actually gives our minds chances to actually experience different environments. And so stresses of one environment can actually be mitigated and modified by being in the other environment. And then the weekend comes along, we can get a sense, okay, now we're going to spend 48 hours uh, with our family. Unfortunately, all of this has been changed. Not only are we now trapped in the same environment 24 hours a day, but even the weekend doesn't really mean anything different from the rest of the week. And this can sometimes create uh, you know, very difficult uh, stressors for people in the home, particularly, for example, uh, when relationships, relationships are already a little troubled even before the pandemic. So friends, lots of uncertainty. Let me say that the human mind has evolved over millennia to react to uncertainty by anxiety. And anxiety in that sense is a completely normal evolutionary response to uncertainty. It is in fact a survival mechanism because what does anxiety do? What anxiety really does is that it creates, and I'll use here a term that is used by neuroscientists, arousal. By this, we mean that the brain is hyper alert. During, our, during the, you know, the, the millennia gone by, when our ancestors lived in caves, for example, um, this kind of anxiety was essential for our survival. For example, uh, if there was a large, dangerous animal outside the cave, we would be hyper alert because this would help us protect ourselves from being eaten up by that animal, keep us completely, constantly aware of every little shadow, every little noise. This is a very important part of the human stress response to, to, to threatening events, to uncertain events. And it is something that we actually thrive on. Uh, you know, for example, I am pretty sure that all the lawyers out there will remember when they were about to go into a very important case where there was a lot of uncertainty about the outcome, where your legal opponent was a very prominent lawyer. And I think each and every one of you will recall those moments and recognize actually the hyper arousal that you experienced, the fact that you didn't sleep so well the night before. Now, this is all normal and it actually makes you perform much better. The problem right now is that we're facing uncertainties in almost every aspect of our life. In other words, the uncertainties are pervasive and they have been persistent over more than four months and likely they will continue for several months more. In other words, they are also very chronic. And it is this combination of chronicity, of persistence, along with pervasiveness 
that makes this particular uh, uncertainty completely unprecedented. And it is in this context that this particular reaction of our mental health could become very toxic for some of us. So while it is correct to say that many of our reactions of anxiety, worries, sleep problems, irritability, uh, fluctuating moods and hopelessness might in fact be quite rational responses of our minds, it is actually the persistence and the pervasiveness that can become quite toxic to some of us. And it is this that leads me to the second act. Um, as you remember, I mentioned that there are really two acts in which uh, these, this particular uh, pandemic of poor mental health will play itself out in. Um, the second act is what happens as this particular situation continues. It becomes more persistent and especially especially as the economic consequences uh, of this pandemic begin to bite deeper into our mental health. I want to draw here to something that is very worrying for me, and it should be worrying to a whole country. Uh, and that is the observation that was made by Angus Deaton, who is a Nobel Prize winning economist from Princeton University. He uh, wrote an incredible book uh, earlier this year called The Deaths of Despair. Um, now, you might wonder, what is an economist uh, you know, doing with conversations about mental health? Well, he and his colleague Anne Case have demonstrated compellingly that in the decade that followed the uh, financial recession of 2008, the life expectancy of working age Americans, especially white Americans, actually fell, making America the only OECD country to experience a fall in its life expectancy in the last decade. Almost the entire contribution to this falling mortality was due to suicide and substance use. And these economists uh, really account for the main reason for this, uh, this uh, rising mortality as being due to the growing inequality in America, the weakening position of labor, the depolarization of American society, which of course we can all see really in sharp relief right now, uh, and the lack of prospects for an entire industrial sector for the future, particularly because of automation uh, uh, and the movement of large numbers of, uh, of working class jobs uh, to uh, low labor economies. Now, by all accounts, the economic recession facing the US and indeed facing India and many other countries will be incomparably greater uh, 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 today. Um, you know, I was just reading a scary statistic from the US uh, uh, this morning, actually, uh, where it's reporting that about a million people each week are now registering for unemployment in the US, which makes this the largest and the deepest recession in recorded history. It's, it's expected that the US economy will actually contract by nearly 35% next year. I don't know what the predictions for India is, are, but clearly when the US, the biggest economy in the, in the world, sputters, uh, that every economy sputters as well, uh, regardless of the, uh, the impact that the, econ uh, the pandemic is having on India directly. Now, India tragically shares many of the ills of American society. Uh, I don't need to repeat all of them. Uh, but in addition to all the ills economically, it also has a very, very fragmented mental health care system, which even before the pandemic failed to reach more than 5 to 10 percent of our population. So really, we, we, we do need to pause here. And, and just, first of all, recognize that the mental health difficulties that many of us are experiencing can be fully understood in the context uh, of the uncertainties that the pandemic presents, but that actually some of the threats to our mental health may even grow further in the weeks and months ahead. And therefore, we really do need to act now, both as individuals, but also as a broader community of professionals and as a country to make sure that the sort of uh, in unfolding of uh, a crisis of mental health problems that has been seen in the US in the past decade and indeed in many other countries uh, for following such economic recessions uh, does not happen here. We have warnings. We know that there is a danger, but I want to really turn in, uh, you know, very quickly to some positive stuff, uh, which is we also know what the solutions might be to some extent. It's important to recognize that uh, my solutions don't uh, reflect the larger econ economic uh, factors because you know these are obviously beyond us and we hope very much uh, and we pray very much that our country and uh, and the broader global economy will will be responsive reflexive uh, and will react quickly 
uh, to ensuring that we don't go into a deep abyss of recession. Uh, but that is beyond our control. Uh, what I really want to focus on is the things that we can do as individuals and as a community of lawyers and professional groups uh, to actually uh, promote our mental health and prevent a slide into mental health problems. Now, that takes me to the final part of my talk, uh, which is the solutions. One of the good things that I have seen um, in this pandemic um, has been, as I said, a growing conversation about the importance of mental health. This was long overdue, uh, and it is very, very welcome. Let me tell you, as a, as a professional, when I started 25 years ago in this area, uh, most of my uh, family members, for example, and I can again call upon my wonderful uh, family of lawyers, we used to really think about mental health problems as something that affected only a minority of our population, a very important cause, but one that really wasn't part of the mainstream. Uh, in fact, I also remember uh, uh, you know, many, many years ago, now when I was courting my then girlfriend, uh, 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 you know, Gauri, Gauri, who's, uh, who's now my wife, I remember, you know, uh, my, my, my family, her family, in fact, asking me, you know, what's the prospect uh, for, uh, for a psychiatrist in India today? Um, you know, it was a very stigmatized profession then. Um, and similarly, the subject of mental health was also very stigmatized. And it's not surprising, and we can return uh, to, to, to why that was um, uh, at that time. What's really good news today is that I don't believe that stigma exists anywhere near what it was 25 years ago. Um, the very fact that Prashanto uh, has invited me to this webinar and that so many of you have connected today is testimony that I think there is a growing public acknowledgement and interest in mental health. Alongside that, um, and, and I think this openness, this ability to talk about our, our mental health is very much part of the solution. The thing that hurts the most is when we have to keep it silent, when we have to keep it private, when we are filled with shame and fear about that experience. Clearly, this is something that is coming out of the shadows, and I welcome that. Alongside that, I think there has been a burgeoning of um, a, a variety of different services uh, to support people who are having mental health problems. Uh, in large part, I think the emergence of telemedicine has really come into play in, in a wonderful way these days. Um, I think the fact that there are more than a dozen providers now of uh, uh, telecounseling services in India, and that might be an underestimate, both in the private sector uh, as well as the NGO sector. The government has also uh, uh, been launching as many different telecounseling services as it can in different parts of the country. Um, these are all very welcome. Uh, they're also very welcome, of course, because for the first time, a psychological intervention, you know, you can't give medicines on a, on, a, on a telemedicine platform very easily. So much of the interventions that are being provided are in the form of psychological interventions, counseling therapies. And I welcome that because for far too long, the practice of mental health care has been dominated by medication, dominated by diagnoses and dominated by doctors, the so three Ds, you know, doctors, drugs and diagnoses. Uh, and I think we are now beginning to embrace what we should have embraced, which is a much broader conversation and understanding uh, about mental ill health, uh, which combines non-medical approaches, psychological and social approaches, and approaches that involve each and every one of us uh, in, in, in mental health care. Now, one of the limitations of uh, telemedicine, of course, is um, the digital divide. I don't suppose many of you on this webinar uh, would have to deal with that. Uh, but, you know, if I had to th put my public health hat on and think about the large inequities in our country that I referred to earlier, uh, you know, the truth is uh, that a vast number of people in our country do not have access to the Internet. Um, you know, a, a good example of this is, uh, you know, we've been talking a lot about moving education to remote uh, digital platforms. I read an, a stunning statistic just last week uh, that less than one in ten rural kids actually have access to the Internet in their homes. Um, and even when the internet is accessible, um, it's usually on a device that belong, that is shared by all the people in the household. You know, so we have to just pause and think about some of the, uh, uh, you know, as we rush into digital solutions for everything, I guess we just have to think and pause about, uh, you know, uh, 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 to what extent are historic inequalities in our country going to be perpetuated by, uh, by that rush. So for me, what holds really a great promise in our country of our diversity and the resources are the frugal innovations, the innovations of which are low cost that Indian scientists and NGOs have pioneered. 
And I want to really talk briefly about uh, one such uh, uh, organization, Sangata, which is an NGO uh, that I co-founded 25 years ago. It's headquartered in Goa, but has large hubs in Bhopal, New Delhi, as well as a smaller hub in Pune, which has really been at the vanguard of demonstrating how lay people and community health workers, peers, can, with appropriate training and supervision, effectively deliver psychological interventions for a whole range of conditions, from depression to drinking problems and even serious mental health problems. It might strike you as amazing what I'm about to tell you now. Sangat, about six or seven years ago, developed a six-session treatment for severe depression that could be delivered by lay people with appropriate training and ran one of the largest scientific experiments in the world in Goa. This treatment was then adopted by a, by a group in Nepal, which ran another large scientific experiment, demonstrating the effectiveness of this treatment in Nepal. It has subsequently been adopted in Uganda and in Malawi. And incredibly, earlier this year, the US government's leading research funding agency adopted this treatment for evaluation with mothers in the US and Canada. That is probably the first time ever that a innovation developed by an Indian organization has actually been adopted by two of the world's wealthiest countries. Today, Sangat is forging partnerships with several state governments to scale up these psychological interventions to the ASHA workers, uh, who are the you know, government of India's uh, community health workers, and in doing so, is are react, reimagining how mental health care can be delivered in some of the most low resource communities in our country. So friends, the point I want to make here is that mental health is everyone's business, it's not just that of doctors, not just that of psychiatrists, not just that of hospitals. I want you, you to use the chat boxes now to start telling, sharing with your broader community what are the things that you have been doing to support your own mental health and that of others in your community? I want to end by talking a little bit about the things that I believe that um, the science tells us can be done both at the level of uh, professional groups as well as individuals to promote your own mental health and that of others in your community. If I think about your own professional group, let's say, for example, the Bar Association or the Council, some of the things that I would recommend you could do is, first of all, to continue having open conversations like this about mental health and well-being. Don't just make this the subject of a 60-minute webinar with an expert. Make this part and parcel of your everyday conversation with one another. How are you doing, really? And that is not about how many cases do you have and how much money are you making, but really, how are you doing every day, really? As an association, I believe you're one of the wealthiest communities in India. Uh, remember to try and provide for some economic support during these difficult times for those, as you know, we discussed earlier, who's perhaps not doing as well. Try to have a Zoom interaction with your colleagues that are purely social. There must be zero tolerance for harassment and bullying. I don't know about your profession, but I know there's a lot of harassment and bullying that happens in all professions. And I think this is a great moment to look at institutional reform to weed out all kinds of harassment, bullying, nepotism that occurs in every profession. I would recommend for those of you who are senior lawyers to be more flexible with your juniors, with deadlines and expectations. Set boundaries for responding. Recognize that working from home isn't a holiday for people. In fact, it's often much more burdensome, particularly for younger professionals and for women. Think about setting up peer groups to support those who you know are more likely to be affected, such as younger lawyers who are just starting off, young women lawyers, particularly those who have young children, etc. And through your association, make free confidential access to telecounseling services with professional mental health providers accessible, available, keeping this, of course, always very confidential. And finally, what can you do as individuals to manage your own mental health? I want to stress that there is no one-size-fits-all prescription for experiences that I explained earlier are profoundly personal, that are profoundly intimately intertwined with our own life stories. But there's some general principles I could suggest. The first is to be aware of and to acknowledge your mental health as you do your physical health. Feeling irritable for no reason should be as important to you as feeling pain in your chest. 
Some of you asked me about signs and symptoms of mental health problems and panic attacks in particular. Well, they're pretty, the, the ones I think you all recognize. Feeling constantly fearful about the future, being unable to relax, feeling hopeless about the future, being unable to enjoy the things that you historically enjoyed doing, for example, reading a book, being unable to concentrate, for example, while you're watching a fun program on TV, feeling disinterested in conversations with friends and family, being unable to sleep restfully, feeling tired all the time. Panic attacks are a more acute anxiety where you almost feel like you're getting a heart attack. You have these acute, uh, uh, extremely distressing uh, symptoms around the heart region in the form of palpitations, your heart beating fast, feeling breathless, sweating intensively. In fact, many people panic attacks actually do think they're having a heart attack and that fear makes the panic even worse. I want to also alert you to substance use. Even when we talk of mental health, you know, many of us don't think of drinking heavily or resorting to drug use as a mental health problem. It is. In fact, it is a very integral part of our mental health, our, our habits and our addictions. And I want you to be constantly aware and conscious about your drinking, about your resorting to sleeping tablets and a variety of other drugs uh, as a way to calm yourself. If you are using these substances in that way, then you can be sure that you are developing a mental health problem and you need to take action on that. Second, talk to somebody about your distressing mental health experiences. Anyone, it doesn't have to be a professional. It can be anyone who you trust, who you feel comfortable with. Remember the slogan that Sangat has coined uh, primarily in a, a campaign for young people in India called, it's okay to talk. This is a community that is already accustomed to thinking about mental health in non-stigmatizing ways. I urge you to feel comfortable to talk to people you trust about your mental health. And the third strategy follows on. If someone talks to you, listen to them. Provide a shoulder to lean on. Now, this might sound a little bit like waffle. You know, um, you know this is the kind of waffle that maybe many of our spiritual leaders uh, might talk about. Uh, and you might wonder, is there any science behind this? Yes, there is a really amazing body of science that shows us that listening and caring for others, building quality in your relationships is not just charity, but actually will make you live longer. One of the most interesting studies that Harvard Medical School has conducted is one that I, that I you know, often cite at, uh, in, in events like this. It's called the Grant Study. Um, the Grant Study is the longest study in the history of medicine. It's been running now for 80 years continuously. Uh, it was twinned with another study that started a few years later called the Gluick study. Both of these studies followed men. Um, those were the days, in fact, only men were ever studied in medicine um, that were recruited uh, in the 1930s and 40s and continue to be followed up to this very day. In fact, we are now following up uh, the children and the grandchildren of those men. We follow them up by, uh, by uh, uh, asking about the health status every couple of years. And the goal of this particular uh, research program uh, was to identify the predictors of healthy aging. Well, as you might predict, you know, smoking and heavy drinking were very important predictors. But you know what was the single most important predictor that determined how long you would live and whether those years of life lived would be healthy? It wasn't money. It wasn't fame. It was the quality of your relationships. The way men responded to questions, not about the number of relationships, but the quality of the relationships was the single most important predictor of a long and healthy life. More than social class, more than IQ, even more than genes. Uh, the leader, uh, you know, the great thinker who started this program, George Weiland, uh, main conclusion, and I'll read it out, I, I'll use his words uh, literally because he says it better than anyone else, is the warmth of relationships throughout life has the greatest impact on your life itself. The fourth strategy is to insulate yourself from the uncertainty by constantly reminding yourself that this pandemic will end like every other pandemic has, and like many countries around us, have already beaten the first surge. And you know, don't get disappointed when you read that as unlocking happens in some countries, there are spikes of cases. That is to be expected. That is the normal. Everyone anticipated that. But look how quickly those countries have been able to return their lives to normal to a large extent. And we will too in due course. Fifth, do meditate. 
By meditation, I don't mean religion necessarily. Of course, those of you are who have faith, that is also one way. But there are many secular forms of meditation, uh, such as mindfulness. And all of these, you know, sometimes it might be quite baffling. You know, should you go to Sri Sri? Should you go to mindfulness? Do you do yoga? Um, you know, it doesn't matter. They all do the same thing. All of them encourage you to practice the same fundamental techniques of finding a peaceful, quiet place in which you can close your eyes, block out external sensory stimulation, and focus your mind on inner sensations like your breathing. Think about it. Every single form of meditation basically does the same thing. And we have very strong scientific uh, proof uh, demonstrating that practicing this kind of meditation reduces stress levels, reduces hyperarousal, reduces blood pressure, and ultimately improves mental health. Six, maintain a daily routine. Uh, one of you asked me a question about toxic social media. You know what? I never got onto social media. This was something uh, that I had made a decision on many years ago. I never went to Facebook. I never went onto Twitter. And I think I'm a very much happier person uh, for that. Um, you know, social media still sort of interrupts into my life through WhatsApp. So what I do is, and I can speak from my personal experience, is that I have a strict routine. I wake up at a strict time every day. I swim. Right now, pools are closed, so I go for a walk. Uh, I always find time to read a book. And I limit the amount of time on social media to 30 minutes in the morning and 30 minutes in the evening. And that's about it. And that includes uh, uh, the time that I give uh, to reading online news. Of course, for news, I have some favored uh, uh, you know, providers, and those are the only ones I restrict myself to. I never look at any other news. And finally, if in spite of these six different things or any combination of them, you still continue to feel persistent distress, and this is coming in the way of your well-being, seek help from a professional that the Bar Council or any other group has made available to you in a confidential way. Telecounseling makes accessing mental health care easier than it's ever been before. Friends, in closing, uh, I believe this is a historic opportunity to acknowledge and address our mental health. Uh, certainly, as a system, we need more money, but we also need to be guided by the best science. And what I've told you right now might sound like a little bit of waffle and light heart talk, but it isn't. Every single thing I've spoken to you about actually has a very strong grounding in science. For example, when I said about walking and swimming, exercise, we know, is one of the most powerful stimulants to the brain. Uh, and so it may sound like, you know, feel good uh, advice, but there is a very strong grounding in science. And the key point I really try to address to you right now is that we must look at mental health as something that matters to each and every one of us at every given point of our lives. And in the same way that we do things to promote our physical health, we should also be doing things for our mental health because this is our most valuable personal asset. I can't imagine a more valuable investment that you can make to your personal life than right now. Thank you all very much, uh, and I'm going to hand back to Ranveer for some questions. Thank you, Dr. Patil, for sparing time for us. We are hugely indebted to you. And a large number of lawyers have joined. And since yesterday, we've been receiving a lot of questions. We took time out. Prashanto and I took time out. And we have filtered them. We know that we are run running against time. And we have to finish this session by 5.30. Uh, so, so I was uh, just uh, before I come to the questions, uh, you said that Sangat model has been accepted across the world. Many countries have accepted it. Uh, is it possible that our bar council and bar association can also adopt it? Is, has any uh, professional body adopted it and made use of that Sangat model to respond to health issue, uh, mental health challenges? So what Sangat does, uh, 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 Ranveer, is it actually designs uh, psychological treatments that can be delivered by uh, trained uh, health workers. Um, and so our, our focus has always been working with the public system. So we reach the rural and remote parts of our country and the urban poor. So, so far, I've never actually worked with, uh, uh, you know, urban populations, and that is something which I want to do now. Um, and Sangat certainly, for example, is setting up a major telemedicine platform. It already has one going uh, with a few partners called Covidab, which has been providing telecounseling services uh, across the country because telemedicine can reach anywhere instantaneously. Um, and so right now, we're actually in the stage of developing a national strategy to reach our psychological treatments to a larger population. It isn't specific to the bar community or any. It could be for anyone. 
Um, but you know, the pandemic has made us move much quicker, to be quite honest. Um, we're also developing a curriculum for self-help, uh, which is based on the World Health Organization uh, 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 treatment. Um, and so hopefully in the coming couple of months, we'll have something uh, which I would be able to make available to your broader community as well. But within the next couple of weeks, it is very likely that our telecounseling services will be made available uh, uh, much more publicly. Right now, it's a little bit more focused, uh, but it will be available more publicly. Thank you. So, uh, Dr. Patel, you would know that uh, our, uh, so far as lawyers are concerned, we are now working at an efficiency of 10%. So, the courts are shut. So, I think law, we are the only professions who are completely kept out of our workspace. Every other professionals are able to uh, either work from home or go to their offices. But even if we are working from our offices, we are working at an efficiency of 10%. So there are two things that are ha happening. One is that, uh, of course, the, the income is impacted. And second is that uh, the lawyers would go to the court and finish their court, finish their court work, and then would spend a lot of time in the canteen and talk to each other. Now that talking is not happening at all. And that is also impacting particularly the young lawyers who would talk to each other and would understand the problems that others are facing and would share their problems. So that is not happening at all now because there's no cafeteria, there's no lawyers meeting each other in the courtroom. So there are lawyers, several lawyers who have asked us a question as to how would they know that a mental problem is setting in, you know, they're because they're not interacting with anyone. So how would they know? Is there any telltale sign? Yeah, you know, to be honest, Ranbir, I don't think this is only for the legal community. You know, my colleagues in medicine are saying the same thing. Although the medical profession has been able to uh, perform obviously essential roles, you know, um, uh, and is, is nobody would question the role of medicine right now of all times. Uh, the truth is, you know, in the private sector, there has been a plummeting of um, of income as well. Um, and so I, I think this is affecting, you know, many professional groups. Uh, and there might be some specific things about the legal community, but there are also more broader, uh, you know, professional groups that have been affected. You know, one of the questions really is uh, whether the the movement to uh, remote platforms can actually expand opportunities for lawyers. And uh, I don't know to what extent that has happened. Certainly, as I mentioned earlier, for mental health care, it's, this has become a bonanza um, because it means that if I was a, a private provider, I could be sitting in my in my office in Goa and be treating me patients in Assam. Uh, you know, so this is something we could never have done before. It would be not considered even acceptable. So I wonder to what extent can the Bar Council and the Bar Association start examining how uh, working remotely can actually become a way to improve access to legal services. You and I know fully well that even though there is so many lawyers in India, there is still a huge legal divide. You know, huge numbers of people and organizations are unable to access lawyers. Is this an opportunity to create, create a kind of a remote legal service? Uh, the second thing I want to say is about informal interactions. I do think this is a huge issue. And although Zoom is never going to be a replacement for the kind of, you know, the warmth of sitting in the same room and having a cup of tea together, at least it's a stopgap. You know, let's not dismiss it. And I did mention earlier, you know, using this sort of digital communication, not for work, but actually programming and having as now increasingly people are doing, you know, once a week, we're going to sit together, we're each going to get ourselves a, a favorite drink, whether it's a cup of tea or a glass of beer. Um, and we're just going to talk about what's going on in the way we used to like in the old days, can be something groups of friends and peers can actually put together. Now, a totally separate question are the signals. Uh, the signals, I think, are, are many. Uh, one signal that I think is really important that I mentioned is if you're seeing uh, your drug use or alcohol use escalating. Um, you know, all many of us are, uh, you know, consume alcohol, you know, as part of our social life. Uh, but if you sense that you're actually starting to drink more than usual or you're, use, you're drinking to go to sleep, that's a red flag. That's immediately a red flag. Uh, the second is when you have persistent feelings that, you're, that you don't see any future for yourself that even in spite of your constant efforts to try and reassure that this is a passing phase, uh, that there is, but you cannot get past that and you constantly see the future in a very negative way. The third is if you completely lose interest in things that you always enjoy doing, nothing cheers you up. The fourth is persistent sleep problems. Uh, you know, if your sleep is constantly disrupted day after day, and I use the word persistent, okay? This is really important. You know, a single night's bad sleep is completely normal. 
couple of nights is also not abnormal, but if it happens night after night for a couple of weeks, that is something to worry about. Uh, and finally, uh, I would say, you know, a constant sense of something terrible about to happen, accompanied often with physical discomfort, like the heart beating fast, uh, etc. These are signals that you do need to seek a, a professional assessment uh, uh, in order to assess whether you might be having a clinically significant as opposed to just a normative uh, 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 mood or anxiety problem. Uh, here is a an interesting question which two three of them have asked and i'm surprised how there's an overlap so the question is do you think that neoliberal economic policy which is now the global order has impacted the mental health in any way yeah you know one can only speculate but you know i i'm very heavily influenced by economists like angus deaton and abhijit banerji uh, who have actually both of whom have worked uh, very closely on issues to with economic uh, the structures of the economy and people's well-being. Um, and I think if you speak to them, they will say there's no question about it. Um, you know, but of course, economists don't always agree either. Uh, you know, and of course, this is also highly political. So personally, as a scientist, uh, I have actually researched um, inequality. We published a, a work uh, looking at um, income inequality at the country level or at the subnational level and the prevalence of mental health and substance use problems. And we found that there's a strong association. Um, actually, a terrific book that deals with this is called the spirit level. Uh, it's been written by two economists uh, uh, and social policy researchers, um, uh, essentially uh, that's uh, Wilkinson and, 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 and Hackett. And what they did was to show that in the OECD world, those countries that were most unequal, the US of course is at the top of that league, um, had the highest rates of incarceration in prison, the highest rates of substance use related mortality, the highest rates of suicide. And those that are least unequal at the other end, Japan, have the lowest. Um, and so I think there is a lot of compelling evidence and there are a lot of reasons why that might be the case. Uh, you know, by the way, you know, this is a big question for India. India is now one of the most unequal countries in the world. I'm sure many of you have been looking at those data. And the inequality is actually growing at an exponential rate right now. And what can we as a country do to make it a fairer society is not something which I think is a, is a question that should concern every Indian today. Thank you, Dr. So now here's another question where uh, one uh, Mr. Varun Tyagi is asking, uh, is it possible that you have enough opportunities, enough economic resources at your disposal and still you may be suffering from mm -hmm. depression? Is how, how much of opportunity and economic well-being connected with the problem of depression? And yeah, I think it's a great question. It's a really great question. Let me be honest, mental health problems are a great equalizer. It affects everyone across every single social bracket. The only difference between the wealthy and the less wealthy is this, that the kinds, the two ways, first of all, the stressors that the less wealthy experience are much more structural uh, and therefore much less likely for you to be able to address. For example, if you are a Dalit um, in our system, this is a structural barrier of discrimination uh, that, you know, unfortunately, you are not, your agency to change that is much more limited because this is a historic structural social barrier. When you're, when you're wealthy, those structural barriers are much easier to negotiate. You can go past them. You know, if you're a wealthy Dalit lawyer, the chances are, for example, that you're much more able to actually negotiate the structural discrimination uh, about your caste. Um, so wealth allows you uh, uh, somewhat more resources and ability to negotiate past those barriers. But wealth in and of itself does not protect you from the impact that chronic stressors have on your biological function of your brain. Please be aware that mental health is not a figment of some outer environmental factor. Mental health is entirely mediated through changes in neural circuits. Um, it is finally a dysfunction of your brain, particularly the prefront, the front part of your brain. In as much that, for example, losing control on your limbs is because of brain damage, Losing control on your emotions is also because of a dysfunctional brain. Uh, but the question is, uh, what are the stresses that affect that? Uh, they differ across different social classes, but they occur in all social classes. And how likely is it that you can actually address it? And the wealthy have a, a little bit more capability because of the resources at their disposal uh, to address it. But it doesn't protect the wealthy uh, from mental health problems. Thank you so much. And this is the last question. Now I can see that we're running out of time. And after that, there's a young lawyer called Pallav Mongya. He'll join in to thank you. 
So the last question is that is there any particular type of mental problem that a profession like law or lawyers would suffer, which is unique to this profession, given the fact that we are there to solve problems for for others. We are the problem solvers of the society, and here. We are encountering problem at our own mental level. So, is there any particular type of mental problem which lawyers in particular suffer? Uh, can Should I interject? Uh, I'm really sorry. Can I interject with one privilege since I'm there as part of the panelist? One quick question aligned with that: If you get a feeling of of suicide or you want to end your life, uh, how do you deal with it at that time? I mean, if it suddenly comes upon you, or so, what is the red flag for that? That you are heading towards a situation like that? And when it happens or it's happening to you, how do you do it? Because everything is out of your control. So that's the additional question. I'm sorry to interject. Not at all, Prashant. Let me answer that question first. Okay, the most important advice I want to give you is that at some point in our lives, almost every single person will have a thought that life is not worth living. Let me assure you, this is a universal. It's part of the way we are wired. The most important thing that each of us will remember, let's be honest, just to think back of our own lives, that the point that you know we felt utterly hopeless, everything looked really bleak, and you went through that period when, or that thought, what's the point of living? We are still here today. And the most important point to remember is that suicidal ideas are very common. They are very part of our normal human reaction to, uh, to, to loss or to threats, but they are mostly transient and impulsive. And it's extremely important to recognize the transient nature of suicidal thoughts by drawing on our own experiences and remembering what are the things we did to pull ourselves out. And the most important thing I would urge everyone to do is to never act on a thought. Always pause, because the moment you pause, the moment you then use that opportunity to rethink your situation and especially share this with someone else, 99% of the time, those thoughts actually reduce in intensity and disappear. Now, to answer your question, Ranveer, about law, you know, to be honest, I haven't really seen any studies about lawyers in particular. I can't imagine there's anything particular about lawyers other than what you share with all high-stress professions, including the medical profession. The medical profession, many of you will probably be surprised to hear, um, is one of the high-stress professions for suicide. Um, and many people have really seen this as because of the stress of, of, of medicine. But you know who is the most highest risk group for suicide is an anesthetist. And the reason is that they have access to means. So one of the very important things I will tell you, if you are ever worried about acting on suicidal impulses, make sure that there are no means available in your home. And the most common means, friends, are pesticides in India. Um, you know, it's very, very important to make sure all pesticides. This is a good practice, regardless of whether you have suicidal ideas or not. Never store pesticides. Um, uh, luckily, in urban households, that won't be the case. But in rural communities, that's a big thing. And of course, again, in India, we're protected because of our gun laws. Never have a gun in the home. Uh, uh, these are both uh, the most important causes of suicide deaths and could have prevented thousands of deaths around the year if they were actually not uh, allowed in your home. Uh, so, Ranbir, I don't know if there's anything particular about the legal profession. Uh, I think it's just another, you know, it's, it's, um, it, it's, it's a cost of what happens when you work in a high-stress profession like medicine. So, thank you, Dr. Patel. Now we have Pallav Mongya is a young lawyer. You would just like to express his vote of thanks. Thank, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, today, I deem it as a great honor to propose a vote of thanks today, especially for making this seminar such a success. The topic is really close to my heart since I personally know of people who have suffered struggling with these issues and I uh, really endeavored to uh, make a difference. So I, it wouldn't have had a better start uh, to work towards it and trying to make a difference. So uh, to start off with, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Patel today uh, for uh, taking time out and uh, um, sharing his valuable thoughts with us. What is most useful about it is not only just being a lip service, but actually providing solutions uh, to how we can deal with how as young lawyers or young people or anybody in fact uh, across all age groups are supposed to find solutions or find non-medical solutions to those problems especially by pointing out the finger that it's the uncertainty which affects uh, your mental health and uh, which allows us uh, you know, to provide self solutions to those problems for example trying to come up with things uh, I remember uh, uh, Mr. Nariman used to say that never invest everything in this profession always have a hobby or something to take you along so that 
at least in that thing you can have that certainty in place if not the outcome of your uh, hard work in this profession so thank you sir thank you for taking time out and uh, this session has benefited so many of us we are very grateful to you subsequently i'd like to thank dr singh uh, mr sen and mr singh for all of auditing the entire session and allowing me to be a part of it and uh, this is an endeavor which all of us are trying to take forward and i'm sure we'll uh, get better at it and reach out to people who actually matter and make a difference and then i'd like to thank the entire live law team uh, who have been very proactive and uh, very dedicated to make sure that this things happens uh, at such a scale and uh, finally thank you to all the audience and the participants who with their questions and attending have actually uh, given us some hope that we are doing our bit to make a difference and hope you have benefited from this uh, session so thank you so much